Okay. Um, so what Mrs. Wheeler was saying, it is so true as far as IV push medicines, we are going directly into that vein. Even, even though our piggybacks are going into the vein, let's face it, I, I hang it up here, I walk out of the room and I'm like, oh, that was at the wrong rate or whatever. You catch yourself. You still have all this time. There is zero time to catch a mistake, fix anything when we're talking IV push medicines. It's going either A, directly right here at the hub, or B, at our closest Y port to our patient. So th there's no room for error. Um, and when you start looking at your um, complications, if we ingest them as a PO versus if we take them as an IV push, they tend to be much more severe as the IV push when we're looking through our drug book, correct? So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're going to make an error and you're going to harm your patient, this is when we usually do it. So don't go in doing an IV push all distracted. I will tell you guys up front that our local hospitals down here have policies that first year nursing students are unable to do IV push. So we are going to learn this skill, you're going to get checked off on it, and then if you're successful, when you hit the doors in 200, you're able to start doing IV push meds from day one, okay, instead of wasting several weeks in 200, learning the skill, getting checked off on it. So that's just a heads up. As of tomorrow, if you pass, you get to do your piggybacks and your primaries, you just can't do our IV push, okay? All right. So what we have here is our um, skill checkoff, okay? A lot of this stuff is very similar to what we did today until we get to the point of actual pushing. And then you also have an MAR, it's a front and back. So we're gonna go ahead and start with um, the hydromorphone on Miss Susie Bonebreaker here. So <coughs> the very first thing is just to you're going to come into the room, you're going to write down your seven R's, okay, just like you did today, and you're going to uh, verify your orders. We want to make sure that we have a good IV site, and there's nothing worse than getting ready for your 10 o'clock meds, and we go in the room and we see that the IV site's all swollen. You should have that site assessed at your initial morning assessment, okay? So we want to know that this site's good to go. We want to make sure if um, interventional radiology came in, you know, and they injected something, we would want to definitely flush it and make sure that it's okay, nothing's clogged, it um, um, flushes easily, there's no drainage, no leakage. Leakage is a big one, especially with our elderly. So you're really assessing this site for the warmth, pain, tenderness, any of that kind of stuff. Then we're going to take a look at our MAR and we're going to look at that um, as compared to our prescriber's orders. So this patient has a uh, saline lock-in, and look at what happened, our night nurse <laughs> hooked up our fluids. We're gonna start by disconnecting this, because we're gonna do Susie first. That's my fault. Okay, so we have a saline lock-in, all right? And we need to give hydromorphone or Dilaudid. Guys, couple things with Dilaudid. When we look that up, Dilaudid is six times stronger than morphine. So think of morphine, okay? What drug is it? What classification? So how many of you have your drug books? Go ahead and pull it out. Just to, for time purposes, you're gonna find your drug on page 653. Tell me, somebody, what do you see here for um, your classification? Okay, it's an opioid analgesic, and then when you look at your pharmacological, it's an opioid agonist. Just FYI, I don't know how many of you use your books. Um, there's a whole section in the very beginning that talks about classification. So how Mrs. Wheeler was saying, learn, learn the class, and then you are going to learn some of the pharmacological classes and you can group a whole ton of meds. So when we get to diuretics, look up diuretic and then you'll see, oh, okay, we've got a loop diuretic, a potassium sparing diuretic, a 
affected by diuretics. So get the umbrella term, diuretic, then you're going to go to your specific. So we know that our opioid, our, our hydromorphone is an opioid analgesic. And then what else do we need to know about it, guys? What, what's real important here while we're looking this up? Okay, it's a Schedule two. What does a Class two mean? Again, flip to, on this one I'm going to tell you, page 1409. 1409 on the back of your book. It talks to you about classification, especially with our controlled substances. So look at what does it say about a Schedule II? Okay. okay, high potential for abuse. So if you're an ER nurse, and lo and behold, this patient keeps coming in and asking for Dilaudid specifically, you might say, is abuse going on? On the other hand, you have a patient with cancer pain and they need the Dilaudid and they don't want to take it because they have a fear of abuse, okay? They have a fear that they're going to become addicted. And what happens with these patients, they do develop a tolerance and we do have to increase the dosage level to obtain the same pain relief, but it's, they need it. It's not being abused. They're, they actually need the medication. So when you look at your schedules, Take a look. What, what do they actually mean? It's in here in the book. You just have to know how to use your book. Okay? So this is a class two. So we are, are a schedule two, potential for abuse, um, and we need to pay attention to that. All right. So then what else do we have to have any idea about with this, guys? Okay. So do they have allergies to other opioids? Does Miss Susie Bonebreaker have an allergy? Do I have to be concerned? Go back to your classification. Is it in the same class? No. So we're, we're okay there. All right. So we're good with that allergy. It's not contraindicated. What else do we need to know, guys? Okay. Drug drug interactions. At this point, there's nothing infusing, it's, a, it's locked. Okay, so we don't have to worry about a drug-to-drug -drug interaction at this point. What were you saying, Cheryl? Okay, is it a safe dose? So, have you found that yet? What you're going to find with your opioid analgesics is that we're going to start at a low dose and we can keep increasing by 25 to 50 percent until we get the amount of pain relief um, that's acceptable for our patient. A couple things, if you're giving an opioid, especially six times as strong as morphine, we need to see if they are <coughs> opioid naive. Have you ever heard that term? Have they received morphine or the hydromorphone before? If they've had it before and they're good to go, all right, I feel comfortable. Versus they've never had this drug before at all. And when you start reading what are some of your um, side effects, that should be kind of a red flag. I need to give the smallest amount and I need to give it at my slowest push rate, okay? And that's kind of finding out, is your patient opioid naive or not? All right, so we're gonna take a look here. So we found out our classification, our therapeutic indications are for pain relief. Um, it works, um, you actually have your drug action by binding um, with our opioid receptors here. If it's in a safe dose range, did we come up with that? It's a, okay, so we're at our safe dose range for this patient, and then we need to know onset, peak, and duration. Okay, and so that's important, guys, because a lot of times your physicians will order your pain medicines every four hours. And look it, if all I need to do is look in the drug book and I see the duration's only for three. And if they're on the call bell at three hours, it makes sense, all right? Instead of saying, oh, they're so demanding. Oh my goodness, all they're doing is seeking drugs. No, the drug is worn off. So that's why we need to know that. Also, 10 to 15 minute on, um, onset, 
again, when you start looking at what are our side effects, respiratory depression, I need to know when I would see these side effects, okay? So we looked up that information. Um, contraindications, what do you think the contraindication would be? Allergies. Definite, allergies. Okay, we're gonna, if they have a low respiratory rate already, we're not just gonna come behind and give this on top, okay? So like your post-op patient still has some um, anesthesia on board, maybe not breathing real fast, I'm not gonna come right behind and give them some of this. So I need to know what their respiratory rate is. I also need to know what their blood pressure is. You have to have vital signs with this before you give it. So if they're hypotensive, I'm not gonna give them some Dilaudid. All of this information is in the drug book, you just need to know it. You need to know where to find it and look it up. Okay, two major adverse reactions. What did you find? Constipation. <laughs> Hypotension. Hypotension is one I would definitely want to watch for. And confusion. and confusion. Both of them. Perfect. Okay. Remember, you're looking to see the ones that are underlined happen most frequently. Um, so we've, we're going to watch for that confusion. We're going to watch for our hypotension. Anytime you put on, a, on an opioid, we definitely want to watch that bowel pattern. Okay. <clears throat> so that's something we need to keep track of. And what other two nursing implications are we going to do? We have a whole list here on the side. Okay, so we're going to actually monitor their vital signs before we give it, and now we know when the onset and peak is. Within 30 minutes, we need to recheck those vital signs. All right, so we know that. That's a good nursing um, intervention. What else? Yeah, if that's what we're giving it for, guys, we definitely need to come back and assess the pain. All right. So we've looked up that. So that's, that's what we would want to have an idea before we start is what's going on with our medicine. All right, so let's get into the skill. So we've gone ahead. We know our seven R's, and um, we've looked at our MAR against our doctor's orders, which we can do right there on computers. We're all acute care, so we all have computers. We can look at that. We're going to go ahead get ourselves, um, wash our hands, get our um, gloves on. We're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves to the patient. Good morning, Miss Bonebreaker. My name's Jennifer, I'm gonna be your nurse today. I understand you're having a little bit of pain. She's gonna tell me, yes, can you rate it for me? Cause you need to document this. Oh, it's excruciating. It's a nine out of 10, where is it? It's, you know, in her abdomen. I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna look at her IV site. I would wear gloves if I'm touching on this, guys, because they can leak, okay? So we're taking a look at that. I'm gonna tell her, I, your doctor has ordered hydromorphone. I'm gonna go see if um, it's time to get it. Have you ever had it before? No, so she's opioid naive. Okay, well then I'm gonna go prepare that and I'll be right back, okay? So I go ahead, take off my gloves, clean my hands, and come up to my, go into my med room and get, start preparing my stuff, all right? So we wanna go ahead, pull out our thing, and just FYI, these come in these pre-filled glass, okay, they're glass, um, glass syringes, they're like a Kerper jet, and this one comes as either two milligrams per ml, or it can come as one milligram per ml. It's a controlled substance, so I will have to go into the Pixis to get it to come out, and I will need a witness to waste it, because either way, I'm only giving 0.5 milligrams. So I need another licensed nurse to witness this with me. Which one should I pick, two or one milligram? One. Okay, so I'll go ahead and hold out my one milligram for ML. Then what other supplies do I need to start gathering? Okay, I got my saline flush. Y'all said alcohol, never can have enough alcohol. <laughs> what else? Okay, gloves. If this was the correct dosage 
guys, I can actually put it in um, this thing that makes it work as a syringe. Miss Wheeler, what's it called? Tubex. Okay, Tubex. And it literally, as long as your white thing is down and this is open, it will lay right in here. I'm going to turn the white thing. There's a little screw on the end, so I'm going to turn it and secure it. And then I would lock it into place. And I could literally go and administer this if I had the full dosage, but I don't, okay? So I'm going to pull it up. How much do I have to pull up? I have one milligram per ml. I have to pull up a half an ml. Guys, please practice with these during practice over the next two weeks. They will be around so you guys are comfortable with them so you don't step in and are confused, nervous, whatever, on checkoff. So if I have a half an ml, what kind of syringe do you think I should use? I have a one milligram per ml. Okay. So we're going to pull up a half an ml. What type of syringe should I pull that half of ml up with? Okay, I hear a 3 ml and I hear a 1 ml. I need accurate measurement. We, we can pull up our 1 ml, okay? If I did the 0.25, if I did the 2 milligrams per ml, that would force me to pull up 0.25. You have, have to use your 1 ml of spirculin syringe to get those accurate measurements, okay? Now, how long am I going to push this over? All right, so we're going to pull it up with our PB syringe, our 1 ml syringe. But how fast am I going to push this over? Three to five minutes, guys. Half an ml over three to five minutes. So what am I going to do to make that realistic to be able to push it over? You need to dilute it, okay? This drug, you can actually see on the top of page 655, um, where it tells you to dilute with at least 5 mLs. They don't always tell you to dilute it, but nursing judgment, if I have a small volume that I have to give over an extended period of time, you can dilute it in normal saline, okay? That's just good nursing judgment. So, what I'm going to do is I have myself a flush. And what type of syringe or what type of needle do I need? I need a blunt needle. Just please look, guys. You have blunt needles in these drawers, and we also have blunt filter needles. Make sure you're not grabbing the wrong one. The blunt filtered kind of has a purplish top to it. The regular blunt needle is all red. So I'm going to grab my blunt needle. And I'm going to put it on my 1 ml syringe. I already did my math, so I know, and I've double checked it. And when you work with carpet jets, you don't want to instill air in them, because what's going to happen is this little plunger on the end is going to hit the ceiling, as well as all the hydromorphone. Okay? All you do is kind of snap it off and it comes right off. There's a rubber, a rubber stopper there. And you're going to go in. And I'm going to pull out my 0.5 ml. Point 
25 ml. And how much should be left in here then? 25 ml. And that's when I ask, <coughs> Marissa, you're another licensed nurse. I'm giving 0.5 milligrams. I'm wasting 0.5 milligrams. She would look and she would say yes. I would throw it into a sharps container right there and sh we would sign in the PICSIT. So there's no question of where did that drug go. Okay. Now, here's my 0.5 milligrams and I need to put it in how much saline? Five. 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 So I'm gonna go ahead and break my seal and then if I was in a med room, I'd have a sink. And I'm gonna go down to five. And how do I get my drug in here without losing drug? All you gotta do is pull back and give yourself some air space, okay? Give yourself some space. And I'm gonna go ahead and put my needle right in here and I'm gonna inject it. That's all there is to it. All right, this is a good time for me to get rid of this. I want to get rid of my air. And before I go any further, guys, what do I need to do? Okay, cap it. <laughs> what else do I need to do before I go any further? Label it. Look at my look at how much mess I have up here. I've got two other flushes. They all start looking the same. So before I go any further, I'm going to get myself a label. <coughs> and I'm going to go ahead and put on here that I have hydromorphone, um, 0 0.5 milligrams in 5 ml, right? And I'm going to put it right on my syringe. So there's no question if I get distracted what I have. All right, so here's my drug. The drug name, the dosage, and my total volume. something like this, I'm not giving any other drug. Okay. That, that's, that's me, because this is a high-risk drug. I would never get caught up in any other drug. But if you think, you're not going to hurt anything by putting a patient's name on there. Okay, so we've got our drug. We pulled it up. We have our right dosage. We used our filtered needle, and we are going to um, go in with a saline flush because I don't have a running IV. All right, I'm gonna go back in, bring all my supplies. I'm back with your pain medicine, Miss Bonebreaker. Can you tell me your name and date of birth? Okay, and I do see you're allergic to NSAIDs, um, but you've never had hydromorphone or morphine before with any um, problems. Never had it a day in my life. Okay. So I have an order here to give you 0.5 milligrams. I would teach her a little bit about it. Don't get out of bed without using your call bell because dizziness, hypotension. Um, it should relieve your pain within 15 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes at the most. I need to, at this point, know if um, I'm going to do it over three or five minutes. What do you think I decided before I came in here? Five Why? Exactly. Okay, so you need to make that judgment before you came in. So I'm going to come in. I've done my check. And I've got the right patient. I've got my hydromorphone. And FYI, this will not scan. You need the actual um, Carpajet to scan. So until you're done with your patient, just don't throw it out. Okay? Um, so at this point, I've scanned it. I've got the right dose and I've done my three checks. Once when I started, once when I finished preparing, and now when I'm in my patient's room for my last time. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and clean. She has nothing rotting. How long do I scrub? 
So I'm scrubbing, guys. <clears throat> if I did see mistakes today, it was you would let go of it. As soon as you let go, it touches your patient's skin and it becomes contaminated and you start the process all over. So just make sure once you're cleaning, your 15 seconds, you need to hold on to that. Okay, this is my regular saline. No, glad I looked. <laughs> this is my regular saline. I'm going to go ahead and break my air, get rid of my air bubble. And how do I flush? Pause. Push pause. So I secure it, I unlock it, I aspirate, I see my blood return, and I'm going to push pause. How much fluid right now? How much? Three. Thank you. 3 mLs because I don't have anything incompatible. All right, so it's a simple 3 mLs. And <coughs> got all 3 mLs. <coughs> I'm going to disconnect. I'm going to re-clean. Okay. And now begins the long process of pushing my meds. Guys, you're going to literally look at your clock on the wall or you're going to look at your watch. And this is a perfect time to have some conversation with your patient because I have 5.5 mLs and I have to push it over five minutes. So it's one mL a minute. And <clears throat> you can either push and just stop, or I usually do just a slow, steady push and make sure that I don't go too fast. Okay, so I'm going to do, as soon as I start talking to her about, you know, what type of surgery did she have and, you know, how has she been feeling, has she been moving her bowels, if not, all that kind of stuff, this is perfect assessment time. Um, and, and I'm also, as I'm pushing, making sure that I don't see any um, changes in my sight, that I don't see any tracking, any red marks, any pain, any swelling. Hopefully, if there was an issue, I would have caught that with my flush right from the get-go. Okay. Any questions as we push for five minutes? Yes. Um, that's a good question. Because at, the, at Nanticoke where I am, what we'll do is we will pull up and waste whatever we need to so the nurse sees that waste, but we have to keep the vial. Does that make sense? So, so we'll push it out and keep it ourselves. Yes. Yep. Or wash it down or drain or something like that. But I have to keep the vial. So if I have one ML in there, I'm going to pull up mix up half of my MLs, my other half I'm going to pull and waste so I can keep my Carpajet to scan. Does it work any different down at other facilities? Same way? Okay. Yes. No, I said it has filtered needles in here. When would you use a filtered needle? When it's the ampule, okay? So nine times out of 10, we use blunt needles. Does it read use filter or? From an ampule, right. So I wasn't, this isn't an ampule. There was no breaking of glass, okay? It has a rubber stopper on the end here. Do I need to clean that rubber stopper but when I take off my needle? Do I need, should I clean that before I? If I contaminate it, it's just, it's no different, guys, than when you have a vial and you flip off the top. If you think or you're unsure, if you touch that rubber stopper, then clean it. Otherwise, it's, it's sterile while it's still, still in the container it comes in. Mrs. Wheeler's container. Yeah.
No, no, I have the actual disc. Oh, okay. It's okay. the sleeve that it sits in to oh, maintain okay. the sterility of it. Oh, I see. Yeah, because okay. um, Maggie was asking me. But that, guys, when in doubt, clean it. If you're unsure or you're in checkoff and you're shaking, clean it. You will never hurt anything by cleaning. You will hurt by contaminating. Yes? Oh, so yes. When you're in the or in the lab, the are not disposable, right? Okay. Perfect. Um, and they're hard to find. <laughs> they're very hard to find. Yeah. And some of the new ones, the guys might have seen the Logan on it. The, uh, it's basically kind of like an applicator. You take it off the string and you sit on the bottom of the pants. So those are the nice ones if you were in control of your house and have a <laughs> Okay, so I am done with my five minute push. And so what I'm doing is talking to my patient, assessing my patient, making sure she's still breathing, okay? Um, and I scrub my hub. And now I need to finish with a flush. How much? Three mLs again. Guys, the key here is that this um, extension tubing is full of drugs. So my follow-up flush has to be at the same rate as the drug was. Otherwise, I'm doing a bolus, a hydromorphone, at the end, okay? So now I've got three mLs that I'm going, if I did five mLs, think about this. If I did five mLs over five minutes, that equates to one mL per minute, right? Mm -hmm. So now I've got three mLs, and I'm going to push it at the same rate one ml per minute. So we can start that push. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, it does, um, but we haven't gotten to that yet okay. because this, at this point, there's nothing that's incompatible okay. because all I have is the saline lock, so nothing's incompatible. As soon as we flip the page and start working on um, the LASIK, you have to flush with a different amount if it's incompatible. Then it has to be 5 mLs, okay? If it's compatible, even if it was hooked up to normal saline running, I would still come up and flush it with 3, give my drug, flush it with 3. If it was incompatible, and let's say I had um, a Lasix drip running, and I was about to give this, then I have to stop it flush with five. And we're going to do that scenario next. Other questions? The biggest thing here, guys, that you guys get hooked, caught up on, and then you start asking faculty and we just get confusion, is your flush has to be at the same rate that the drug was at. So make sure you understand that. Otherwise, you're bolusing them. And I clamp, and I disconnect, and I know that this has took me eight minutes. I got about eight more minutes, and I'm going to have <laughs> my onset work in here, all right? So I will be back to check on you, Ms. Bonebreaker. Do you need anything? Make sure that my call bell is close by, that I would put my bed back down and my side rails back up. Okay. At this point, I definitely have to discard my empty thing of the lauded as well as my carpet jet, which is also has been empty since I left the med room and Marissa had signed off on it with me. Okay. So I would dispose of that, and I would go ahead and wash my, take off my gloves and wash my hands. Document. Understand. Anytime you give a PRN. You have to reassess. So I have to reassess within 30 minutes when it's IV push. If it was a PO pain med PRN, I have to come back and reassess within an hour. All right? So I'm going to be back in within 15 minutes to reassess her and see how she does. Any questions? Huh? Well, I, every three hours? All right, so now 
we're going to go ahead and we're going to run this a this scenario a little bit differently. So we're going to flip over to the other side of our MAR. Go ahead and pause this one. One thing at this level, we are we're working with peripheral lines, but. Once you guys hit um, 200, you're going to start working and actually learning about central lines. And so your central lines can be something like a, a subclavian here or an IJ, and those stay in just kind of short term. There's also implantable ports. You know, if you've ever heard of someone having like a chemoport or a metaport, and they're literally implanted under the skin and they're meant for really long term. Or there's something that is like a peripherally inserted, a pick line. Um, they're inserted either down here at the AC or right about here, and they um, are threaded all the way up and sit in that superior vena cava. Those are all central lines. Central lines we treat a little bit differently than we do peripheral lines. We are using right now for us the SAS method, S-A-S, meaning we um, flush with saline, we administer the med, and we flush with saline. That's SAS. If you do have a patient that has a central line and you needed to give an IV push medicine, the, what we would do there is the SASH method, and it ends with the H. So we flush with saline, administer the med, flush with saline, and we end with heparin. So if it was a capped port on a central line, we would always end with heparin because you don't want it to become occluded. And that's what happens. They sit in those high flow vessels and they can uh, get clotted off. Well, here, if it's a little peripheral, not such a big deal, we pull it out, restart it. Whereas if it's a central line, it's a much bigger deal. So that's the difference between SAS for peripheral, SASH for central line. Okay, so um, Lasix is our next one. And so when we look at this MAR, MAR here, we look, Bill Bush, um, he needs some furosemide, 40 milligrams IV push, and he gets it twice a day. Well, first thing as a nurse, I would say, let me see if I can call pharmacy and change those times. Why? He's going to be up peeing all night. So again, it's just nursing judgment. I'd make a phone call to the pharmacy and say, can we do that at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. so we're not having Mr. Bush up all night. Then I look and see he has an IV of D5 and a half normal saline running at, um, I'm sorry, 25 mLs an hour. He also is allergic to penicillin. Do I have to be worried about a penicillin allergy and a Lasix allergy? Not that we know of, okay? So we'll definitely look through here, but that shouldn't be a red flag. However, if it's said here that he's allergic to maybe hydrochlorothiazide, then when I look at the front, remember your classifications, you will see that there's a cross sensitivity between our loop diuretic, which Lasix is, and our thiazide diuretic. So just be aware of that when you are looking at your allergies. Don't just say, oh, it doesn't say Lasix. Start looking at the classifications in those families like Mrs. Wheeler told us. All right, so let's go through and do the exact same thing. We've got Lasix here. We have 40 milligrams to give. This vial tells us that it's 40 milligrams 10 milligrams per ml. So how much am I going to pull up? 